All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is open source data processing with Open Drone Map, um, part of the UCNR Drone Camp. Uh, I appreciate everybody taking time out to learn about the application. I'll introduce myself a little bit. Um, but if this is not the session you're, you're looking for or planning to attend, you will, you'll be uh, certainly forgiven for dropping and going to find the parallel session. Um, but definitely feel free to stick around, um, even if you just happen to hear through happenstance. So here's, uh, in general, what we'll be going through. I'll talk a little bit about background, both my background and Open Drone Map. We'll walk through briefly how it works. Um, sort of the principles un underlying photogrammetry and open, open drone map. We'll look at a couple of quick use cases where ODM might be of, of interest to people. And then we'll, we'll run through the steps um, of the basics of using ODM. From that point, we'll, we'll actually jump into some of the hands-on exercises um, to get a processing job started. I know we distributed um, early on the steps so that folks may have done this piece already. Um, but that little bit that's in parentheses in the middle of the list there, start hands-on processing. We'll go ahead and walk through that anyway um, and give people a chance to do it uh, for anyone that hasn't. Then that'll, that'll kick off your uh, processing on your end. So we'll all be doing that in parallel. You'll be starting a processing job. And then we'll come back and I'll talk for a bit more. I'll, I'll talk about the, I'll walk through in, in some detail the outputs from ODM, uh, pitfalls and future direction of the project and some additional resources. Then we'll do a quick break. Probably I'll, I'll take five and then we'll do questions for 10 to 15 minutes um, so that everybody gets a chance to have a break. And then we'll run through the hands-on exercises. Your tasks uh, will have finished processing at that point. Um, and then we can all kind of work, work through some basic interfaces stuff together. So that's what we're gonna do in today. Um, Quick intro, uh, myself, I'm a software engineer. I work with a company out of Washington, D.C. called Mosaic ATM. We do a lot of, of um, aerospace and aviation research. Um, we, I'm also the board president of the North Coast Drone Alliance. I live in Cleveland, Ohio, um, and the Open Drone Map project started here as well, even though I, I didn't live here at the time. Um, so I have been a drone industry participant through my work with Mosaic and, and in the software industry for about five years. I have only recently become a drone pilot um, myself. So I got involved with the industry, had a very kind of recreational and, and software based interest in it, um, but really only got my commercial certification from the FAA this year. So that's, that's freshly minted. If you have pilot questions, I'm pro I might not be the best person to ask, but um, I, I know a bit about Open Drone Map. Uh, I've been working with it for a little bit. So I'm also a contributor. I'm not, I don't contribute in the super mathy computer vision-y parts of, of the um, ecosystem. Uh, that's, there are definitely people better with better skills for that than myself. And there are parts of the, it, Open Drone Maps is a set of tools and there are some areas that I know reasonably well and some, some that I don't. So I'll try and, and uh, give you an overview of everything. Some questions I might have to, uh, to defer or refer to. Better, uh, better references than myself, but I'll do my best to answer everything that we have while we're here. That's me. Um, open source, uh, Open Drone Map is an open source set of tools for processing um, drone images and, and creating drone data from, from drone assets. And, and open source, there are a number of other applications that you could use. There are a number of commercial applications available um, and so one of the questions that comes up a lot is why would I want to use an open source tool at all? Um, open source software is popular in uh, lots of arenas. It's popular in academic and research settings um, in particular. Uh, people usually get into it due to the cost. Um, open source tends to be entirely free. Uh, open drone map in particular is free. There are some, you can pay for certain parts of it if you want to sort of either speed up your process or offload processing to some other system or just make certain things easier. Um, but if you want to use Open Drone Map, you, you have access, full access to the entire suite of tools 100% for free. It may take a little legwork on your part, but there's no built-in cost to using Open Drone Map at all. So people get into ODM initially often for the cost, um, a comparable license for Pix4D or um, Agisoft Metashape can run you in thousands of dollars to purchase. Uh, Pix4D is 
a, you know, as you, you can see here, three, 300 to $350 a month for a commercial license. Um, Odium is free for as long as you want to use it. Um, so there's a, there's a very compelling cost reason, but that's not the only, um, that's not the only reason people use open source software. It gives you a great deal of control over your tool chain. You have with open source software, you have access to the source code. You can modify it. Um, if you're, you know, skilled and interested enough to get in there and do it, you can make things work the way that you want, which is really how a lot of these projects come together is it's, it's a collective group of people building stuff, um, and headed in a certain direction to solve certain kinds of problems. So you have this, this level of control and participation in, in the community. You really are standing on the shoulders of giants with open, open source software. There, with a number of contributors, there, there comes a lot of collective wisdom. Um, and you tend to see uh, a, open source projects are inherently transparent, which leads to greater uh, quality and security outcomes uh, frequently as com compared to closed source or proprietary software. So that's the case for open source. It's not the, the right fit for everybody, but this is, these are the major reasons that people get involved with it. Some history on the application itself. Um, open Drone App started as a joke by uh, a guy named Stephen Mather on GeoHipster, which is a kind of an online forum for um, GIS nerds. And at the end of 2013, he, he joked that what was kind of happening in the GIS ecosystem and drone hardware and drone photography um, would, would lead to something uh, along the lines of what was happening with, with um, OpenStreetMap. Um, and so it really was just kind of put forward as a, what do you see in the coming year, um, end of year, you know, uh, New Year's resolution kind of uh, prognostication. Um, but by the end of the following year, Stephen had gathered a group of people together and gotten it uh, funded and an uh, organized project together with several folks, um, uh, also funded in part by the, the place that he worked, Cleveland Metro Parks, and within 12 months had, a, had an organized working uh, open source project to ac accomplish some of those goals. 2015 to 2018, um, a small group of contributors and users just quietly chugging away, expanding, refining the tools and the workflow behind the, behind the application. Um, but really, uh, in the last two years, especially the last 18 months, we've seen significant user interface and feature improvements, a lot of um, output quality improvements, processing speed improvements, and a significantly wider adoption. So um, today, it, there's an active community of international users and contributors to the project. So it's pretty active. Goals uh, originally and, and today, I, I, I referred to OpenStreetMap and one of the it, open source and sort of civic tech efforts tend to attract people who are interested in collectively gathering their contributions together for the betterment of you know, humankind and the world. And so you see a lot of uh, strong interest in the contributors to ODM, as well as a, a lot of open source projects and humanitarian goals, uh, ecology and conservation research, in particular, you know, producing and working with data for the public good. So these are some of the underlying tenets of ODM. It's another reason, um, you know, if you're, if you're not given a lot of photogrammetry, photogrammetry software choices, this, you know, if, if these sorts of, you know, goals of the project and ecosystem resonate with you, then that's another reason you might be interested in ODM. So uh, I'll pause there and see if there, how this pace is. Can I, I just want to check in and, and if there are any issues with my audio or if I'm going too fast, too slow, I'll just, I'll just pause here and see if anybody wants to. Like, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Coming in loud and clear. <laughs> Great. All right, good deal. All right, uh, so the process underlying, um, you may have gotten some of these principles in other uh, drone camp sessions, but I'll just run through them really quickly um, since it's sort of fundamental to how things work and within the application. So structure for motion, this is really the, the main the principle uh, of photogrammetry and, and open drone map. And that's essentially the, the notion that you have two eyes and each of those eyes sees the world from a slightly different position. And, and what's happening in your brain, as well as what's happening in, in Open Drone Map is, and the structure for motion pieces, is you're locating within two different 
<clears throat> excuse me, scenes, common points. So, so you can say that, that point is here in the photo on the left, and it's, it's over here in the photo on the right. And you start to collect those points together, and you develop um, kind of a picture. And by comparing, mathematically comparing where those points are in the two photos, you can start to get a sense for how, what the three-dimensionality um, of those photos um, is. And so by comparing the angles and the position of the points, you can start to build up this sort of three-dimensional understanding just based on two two-dimensional photos that are offset, but overlapping a little bit. So, so that's structure from motion. And then with, um, with photogrammetry software, what you have is not just two eyes, but you have potentially 50 eyes or 100 or 1,000. And so the software can go through and it will take each of those, it'll compare the photos, um, find common points, and build up this very robust three-dimensional understanding of what is, is um, in the scene. And so that's structure for motion. The next step, uh, and that's what happens early on. Um, the next step is point cloud densification. So after those, after a, a few common points have been identified, um, that produces a sparse point cloud. That will that those calculations and, and positions that are all used to kind of figure out more precisely where the cameras are, um, and then it goes through and recalculates everything and comes up with a dense point cloud. So you have a few points here, um, and then your dense point cloud is based on some of that initial mass. It just fills in uh, a lot of the intermediate points there. So that's dense, cloud, dense point cloud. The next step is surface reconstruction. So these are all just points, and surface reconstruction says, okay, for each of these points, let me figure out what the what the um, overlying surface is. Let me let me figure out what the usually the triangles. Um, you know, what's the mesh? You can see, you can kind of see all these little polygons are they're shaped, and for the most part, they're triangles. Um, so um, that's the surface identification, basically, and it's just physical space. It's not colors or any any of that. It's just here's my point cloud. What are the um, you know what are the polygons and and planes and things that that, that are the surface of that? And then. The next step, multi-view stereo, stereo texturing. This takes the surface mesh, this guy, and then reviews it with all the photos and, and all the colors and adds, a, adds color to the mesh, basically. So now you have a mesh with color. Um, that's considered your texture over the point cloud. And then the final step is orthophoto generation. And we'll talk about orthophotos a little bit more, but this is basically, um, this is a lot less interesting because it's flat and two dimensional again, but basically what's happened is it, this is a geo referenced image um, and it's been created by all of those, you know, we'll call it in a, with our test data set. It's about 18 photos. Um, this one here, I think is 80 or 90. But so it's taken all those different photos and it's created a 3D scene and then it's flattened. It. So it's not just taking the photos and stitching them together, um, you know, one side by side. It's actually taking the material you know, 3D existence of stuff that's underneath it, um, that model, and then flattening that and coloring it. And so what you see here is, is this, uh, the reason that's interesting is because it's, it's geographically correct. It's the sort of thing you could load into, uh, you know, mapping software or GIS software. Um, and the distance that you can start to do things like um, measure distance and, and that sort of thing with some you know, some confidence of, of precision there. If you're just stitching photos together, then the photo, if the cameras aren't pointed exactly straight down or, you know, they're slightly different distance away from one another, um, then you have a lot of, you know, none of those things are, are true. You can't really count on the measurements or, um, you know, your picture may be warped and, and wobbly in, in very strange ways, just based on the orientation of the camera. But with an ortho photo, it's just a flattened version of the 3D world. So that's, um, that's how it works underneath. Use cases, would, these are just four kind of common use cases. If, you, if you're interested in this, then you know, you, this is how you might use um, open drone map construction. Uh, so on a construction job, you might use a drone with a standard camera to um, capture images of the site periodically. You, might, you could then take those photos, load them into open drone map and generate an ortho photo and a 3D model of the site. You can use OpenDrone Map to, to perform linear area and volume measurements. 
of things that are happening on the construction site. Um, and then you can use that from a project management point of view or to provide uh, updates to stakeholders and, and kind of monitor progress of the construction project. You can monitor, um, you can remotely see what's happening on the ground um, as compared to plans, things like that. So um, that's one way you might use Open Drone Map in a, or similar software in construction. Agriculture, uh, you could, would have a drone with a special kind of camera, a multi-spectral camera or a camera that um, usually the, the cameras will have the, the kind of the standard um, light that our eyes can see, but then also uh, additional views of light outside that the visible spectrum. Um, and so Open Drone Map can process, can uh, take in that data, process it, run a few, run some algorithms against it, and and then start to produce um, more interesting, um, you know, outputs related to crop health, or you can look at reflectivity and things like that. So you're not, you're no longer restricted to just looking at the color of plants. You can also um, start to sense some of what's going on, on underneath with um, plant health. So, um, so you might have a multispectral camera, capture images periodically of a large field, and then use Open Drone Map um, and its built-in plant health algorithms to monitor crop health to, to both visually and, and um, through the, I mean, sorry, <laughs> lost my word. I, basically to, to visually monitor crop health in different ways and then highlight areas of plant stress for focused attention down on the ground. So, agriculture, uh, emergency management, you can use simple drone with a standard camera um, in emergency management situation. Let's say there's a, a levee breach uh, or a flood that's taking place or is recently taking place. You can I, you can use um, open drone map to quickly identify and, and quantif quantify areas of damage, um, prioritize resources, assess you know areas of, of fill, measure volumes, things like that. Um, and you can repeat flights to monitor progress and then it sort of becomes a construction project after that. Emergency management has a strong use case. Red Cross uses Open Drone Map um, in some areas. Coastal monitoring is one other area. Um, there are a lot of examples. Certainly these aren't the only ones, but um, just as, as example use cases, these are, these are a few. Uh, you might have, and for coastal monitoring, you might have a drone with a, a standard camera, just a DJI Phantom, easy stuff. Um, you can use it to capture photos of a section of coastline, load those into open drone map and generate a 3D model. You might repeat that, those measurements every month or every three months, or you might go out and um, take fresh measurements after a storm to see what effect that, that recent storm has had. So you can take, generate those 3D models, export them, um, and then use another tool such as Cloud Compare, there are several, uh, to assess change over time. That's another way you can use it. All right. So just walking through, uh, next we'll, we'll look at the steps involved. Um, you don't have to do this yet. We'll, I'll, walk, I'll, I'll talk us through the steps and then we'll all do it together. So don't break out your software just yet. Um, I'll let you know when we're doing that. But um, these are, this is kind of a high level view of, of the steps sort of start to finish in using Open Drone Map. So supported systems, ODM will run on Windows 10 um, with you. The manual installation uses Docker. The, the lightning installation is just an application that you download and install. Um, I think it, probably everybody or most everybody on the call used um, the lightning installation. And they're very similar. Um, really the, the major difference with lightning I'll come back to this as well. The major difference with Lightning is you're, you're sort of offloading the process to the Lightning servers. So you don't have to chug through all the jobs and tie up your laptop um, while you have 250 photos processing. So, so it runs on Windows 10 uh, with or without Docker. It runs on Ubuntu Linux. Um, the software itself is developed for Ubuntu Linux. Um, you can run it natively or through Docker. Docker really is kind of the easiest path to install if you want to do everything um, if you want full control over everything because docker is a virtualization environment that allows the, the odium developers to put together a, like a standard machine and then ship that off to everybody so everybody is really using the same machine you can install it natively um, 
if you want, but there's some more manual work involved there. And then depending on which version of Linux you're using, if it's older or newer Ubuntu, you may run into library issues. Anyway, it's, it requires some fiddling, but it can be done. Um, and then Mac OS, I know some people, some people run it on Mac OS, but I have no exposure, uh, personal experience with it. So uh, ways to use it, these are, there are the ways that you can get started with ODM are Legion, and that's just part of the reason that it's um, a little troublesome for people to get into, is I, there are just a number of ways to get started. There, because the project is very um, enthusiastic about uh, being applicable to, to different use cases and you know, people come with interesting scenarios and, and, you know, technical people were always trying to create solutions <laughs> um, and make, you know, and, and make things work for really interesting cases. So there are a whole bunch of ways to use it. Um, and there are a whole bunch of ways to get started. It varies a little bit, depending on how you're going to use it. There are different ways to get started. This makes the whole thing just very confusing for somebody who's never really dealt with it before. So, um, these are kind of the major ones. Web ODM is the most common. Um, Open Drone Maps started as just a set of command line tools because all the processing stuff is, is command line and you know, through APIs in the background. Web ODM was introduced about two years ago and that helped significantly with adoption, with making the tool easy to use and easy to understand um, for people that aren't necessarily so codey. And um, so Web ODM is definitely the best way to get started. Even if you are interested in the backend API stuff, Web ODM is still the, the easiest way to get started. So that's the most common. If you're, on, if you're gonna use Web ODM, there are two approaches to that. Um, there's a manual installation. There's some instructions online to go through, but that is you set up Docker and, and Git, and um, that's basically all you need to install. And then, then you pull down the repo and then it all just kind of works, but there are several steps and it's, it's kind of manual. It's not, definitely not as easy as lightning one. And then there's also an installer and the installer where you see the little dollar signs. These, these are some of the areas where you can pay for stuff within the ODM ecosystem if you want, but you don't have to. Um, wherever there's, there's a dollar sign option, there's always a free option as well. So the installer is something, one of the core contributors to the application is named Piero and uh, he's a gentleman in Florida who has a drone software business, and he creates some tools that simplify the use of ODM um, and charges a nominal fee for them. That money just goes right back into the ecosystem and helps him continue to be a major contributor. It's definitely not, um, it's definitely not some faceless company trying to make money off of ODM at all. It's, it's that money really stays local within ODM. So if you're, if you're spending a little bit of these, they're not very expensive um, and it helps it helps bolster the overall uh, project. So don't, you know, if you want to, great, but you don't have to. So Web ODM, um, there's a free manual installation or you could pay for the installer. It's nominal, it's less than $100, I think. Um, Web ODM Lightning is the easiest way to get started. And it's even, even though you're processing on Lightning servers, because there's a, there's a free kicking the tires, uh, credits situation, you can, you can just try it out for free. And so it's easy to install. It's easy to just set up some photos and run. And that's, that's what we'll be doing in a minute. So web ODM is the easiest to do, but it does kind of commit you eventually to processing on the lightning servers for a nominal fee. If that's what you want to do, it's a great situation for a lot of people. So don't, don't shy away from it, but that's, that's one thing to know about lightning is you're, you're going to end up using their network and paying them a little bit. Um, command line ODM. This is the this is the original um, interface and, and way of, of using Open Drone Map. I use Web ODM myself. Um, you can use there's an API available which allows you to kind of po pipe other. You could put a different you could put your own web interface in, in front of Open Drone Map if you want to do that. If you didn't like the way Web ODM um, lays things out, you wanted to do it yourself. You, you could do it. Um, these APIs make that possible. Live ODM is another approach. That is, you don't have to install it on your computer at all. You just put it on a USB or a DVD. Um, that is, that stuff is prepackaged. It's portable, pretty easy to use, but it costs a little bit of money as well. So that's an approach that works for some people. And um, the Red Cross has a project called Portable OpenStreetMap where they have um, 
hardware that they ship out pre-installed with um, OpenStreetMap and OpenDroneMap and a, and a set of tools for people in um, uh, disaster response scenarios. And so OpenDroneMap ships with that. If you happen to be working in that scenario, you would, you would encounter it there as well. But these are, the, these are the main ones, WebODM that you install or through the installer or Lightning are the, definitely the most common. So as you can see, there are a lot of ways to get started. It's already confusing. Just look for WebODM. All right, and this is what we'll do today. Dashboard, um, having a look at the interface. So you'll see this in Lightning. If you install it locally uh, on Docker, you can do all your local processing. It's going to look exactly the same. I think it just won't. It says something else here instead of Lightning. But um, everything I'll go through here, mostly those are Lightning screenshots. But this all applies equally well to yeah, uh, just a manually installed version. So um, the way it's laid out, on the left, you have some navigation items. Most of your time is spent in dashboard. Um, and then on the dashboard, you, your um, dashboard is divided into projects. So you, I have a project here called Morgana Bluffs. And it has, um, within it, it's got a task and then another task below that. So projects, you can have multiple tasks in there. And typically this will be, it usually ends up making the most sense to have this as a site or a specific location um, that you're flying and then different types of processing underneath it, depending on what you're doing. Um, it's got 16 here is the number of photos that we uploaded for this task. Um, that number can be a lot larger, but uh, in this case it's 16. Number of photos, how long the job took to process. So this one was pretty quick, ran in about seven minutes. And then the status, when, it, when it's running, this will be something out, this will say running and it'll, the little green bar kind of ticks across from left to right and fills that box. But when it's completed, you can see there the job status. And then these buttons give you access to, um, these left three buttons are really where you'll spend most of your time. You can download everything you can, whoops, Okay, I missed an arrow, sorry. Yeah, so you can download your assets here. You can, you can view the map of the job and you view the, the 3D model. Then there are a couple other things just related to the task name and restarting and deleting kind of task management stuff. But these are the three that you care about. To get started uh, with the task, and again, don't do this yet, just watch me and then we'll do it together. Um, you would use this button to select images that you wanna upload. Uploading images is the first thing you do. So you would go and navigate around your computer, find the photos you want to upload. Then if you're using ground control points, I'll just talk briefly about um, ground control points. We're not going to deal with them at all in the workshop today. But if you were um, adding ground control points, you would set these up um, here. There's an internal interface. You can see GCP interface on the left. That gives you a map to play around with. But basically, you're, you're using this interface to come up with a file that looks like this a little text file and then you upload that text file with the photos. So if you're doing GCP, um, this is where you do it. There's also an external editor, which is new. Um, I think that's a paid service. I haven't used it. Um, but if you're using ground control and for our purpose, and you don't have, there's nothing within the tool that says you have to use it. It's a good idea to you know, tighten up your model and your geolocation, but um, you don't have to, you don't have to use ground control points. Everything works without it. It's just, it improves your precision if you add them. Okay. So we'll say you picked your photos, skip ground control for today. Um, once you've selected the photos, you set the configuration here. So this options box gives you some kind of preset bundles of bundles of configuration or um, if you want to get into all the nitty-gritty options here that's in this box this gray box with the little sliders um, but for the most part you can either leave it on default or what we're going to do in the exercise today is pick dsm and dtm i'll talk a little bit more about those but you pick you say you want to you want to do a 3d model 3d model always always is included so i find it a little confusing but um, buildings, if you had uh, a lot of woods, you just kind of pick the configuration that's 
that's good. And if you're not sure what to do, just pick default. Um, 99 times out of 100, it's fine. Uh, unless there's something that you need to go in and, and tune. But starting with defaults is always the best call. Uh, we'll do DSM today because there's one extra output I want to show you. And then once you've picked that configuration, you start the processing. It shows you that uh, the status up here on the right is running. You'll see this little green bar is going to tick over from left to right, fill that. Um, if you want to see what's happening behind the scenes, I find this helpful. You can turn on task input. Just by default, this is off, but if you, if you flip that on, then you'll, you'll see some um, console output from the processing. This is true on, on Lightning too. The server will send that down to you if you want to see it. And then when it's done, you'll see it shows completed here, a little check mark, the time, and then these buttons become available. These aren't available until the job is completed. So there's your time. If you want to download um, your outputs, you can. If you want to just jump in and view the map, you can. If you want to look at the 3D model, you can. All right. And then um, split merge. Let me check our time. 40. OK. All right. So split merge, if you have a job, so 18 photos is not very many. That's easy to do on, on pretty much any configuration of a computer. Um, if you get into the several hundred, couple thousand photo data sets. Um, you need uh, either a pretty beefy machine that you're running this on, and that on, on the order of 32, 64, 128 gigs of RAM, something like that, um, for those larger data sets. Or there's also a feature called split merge, which will, will allow you through, it's, it's a little fiddly to work with, but you basically split up your photo um, into Submodels. You can say these photos go with submodel A and these go with submodel B, and then it'll it'll pipe that off and do those jobs um, either sequentially or in parallel, and it'll basically parallelize the task and then bring everything back together at the end. So it's a fairly new, um, fairly new uh, feature. Uh, it works. It's got some fiddly bits, and you have to configure it in some funny ways, but um, it's in there if you want to. If you're processing large jobs, you'll get you'll get into this a little bit. Um, all right, so I'll pause here for a second. This is probably um, let me tell you what we're going to do here. So this is where we'll go through and we'll start your your processing jobs on Lightning, and then we'll come back and talk some more, and then we'll come back to those results at the end and and work with those outputs. So um, I'll pause here. I think, and see if there are any questions or, um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to do here in, in terms of getting started with the processing. Andy has our chat window. Um, it's looking good. You're, you're making such significant waves as even people reporting an earthquake somewhere, but, um, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. No technical challenges. Um, Yikes. Okay. Of great note. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, I'll, um, so we have, so we distributed some information early on about downloading a set of photos and then you could pre-process those in our step zero exercise. We're going to go through that step zero exercise. So if you didn't get to that, that's okay. I'm going to actually put, let me find the download link in case nobody's done this at all. I think you'll probably be able to keep up. So, I'll put this download link in the chat. Dun, dun, dun. There you go. So this is the link that you'll see up on the screen in a second. It's just a, a GitHub. The photo set's about 62 mags, I think. Yikes. Okay. Okay. All right. We'll push through there. So here's here's the first step. And some of you may have already done it, um, which is fine. Yes, we won't spend a lot of time on it, but um, bear with us if you've already if you've already gone through this. And uh, thank you. Um, this also helps us distribute the the processing loads. So we're not having 150 people sending a processing job up to Lightning all at once. Um, so yeah, so you can download the sample data here. There's a there's a link to that in the chat. The first screen you'll see is just 
GitHub stuff. So if you don't spend a lot of time on GitHub, it's not immediately obvious where to go. Look for this clone or download button screen. And then when you click that, you'll get a little pop out and then download zip is there. So just do that and that'll give you the, the data set. If you've already done that, great. And then unpack that. Once you get it downloaded to your computer, you can unpack that. And it'll give you, there's just one file in the, the root directory called license, um, which doesn't say anything in particular other than you're free to use this or whatever. Uh, and then there's an images directory. And inside that images directory is 18 photos taken from a drone of a park in, um, I think on Lake Superior called Brighton Beach. And they're just taken from straight overhead. And these are the 18 photos that'll be in our, our sample data set. So, um, their uh, total download size is about 62 megs, I think, something like that. So it's not gonna require a, a lot of space on your computer. So unpack those and then open web ODM Lightning. And then there were there are kind of two steps I, I'll just mention briefly, hopefully everybody's done it, um, but if, if things aren't looking the way you expect them to, this is something you can maybe chase down. There are two steps to, to using Lightning. One is downloading the, the client, the application, getting that installed on your computer. And two is setting up an account on Lightning. And so you'll need to have done both. And then you will also need to go in, have gone into your um, Lightning application and then gone into this little Lightning network area over here on the left. And then if you did not connect your Lightning app with your account, if you didn't plug in your account info, this is where you do it. So I'll, I'll go ahead and move forward, but if anybody, um, you know, is showing no credits or, you know, something's not working out, um, then that's, that's something to have a look at. And I, I did get a question a couple days ago too, I'll, I'll mention here. Um, if your account is connected, but it says you don't have any processing credits, there is, there's a step when you first sign up that requires you to go, they'll send you an email and you have to click on that link basically to confirm you have to find that email in your spam folder or your inbox or wherever, click on that link, and then it'll give you the credits. If you don't do that, if you don't have credits, just have a look at that. Um, but assuming that you have everything, everything all connected here, we'll start. Um, and then uh, I'll also sidebar here briefly and say, there's a separate PDF available in the program. I think we just got that added um, this morning, maybe. So if anybody, wanted to, if anybody grabbed that PDF and printed that out, that's um, the hands-on exercises. Just if you want paper to go through it, um, can is 35 pages. So I maybe wouldn't recommend doing it now, but um, that's available in the program. If for some reason you do want to, you do want to do that. So if you have that printout, uh, we're in part A of that. We're in the first section there. So anyway, back to lightning. Um, the first thing you do is open up Lightning, and then once it's open on the dashboard, you should see something like this, unless you've been playing around with it, which is fine. But you want to add a project up here on the right. Give it a name. You can call it whatever you want. This is what I called mine, Chrome Camp 2020, and then create project. And I'll, sorry. I'm, I should probably give a little longer pause for um, people to, to uh, catch up there. All right. Oh, and project. Hmm. That is not one that I've seen. I'm not sure. It, it sh everything should have the add project button. Maybe, um, Make sure you're scrolled up to the top. Try maximizing the window. All right, I'll move ahead. All right, let's assume you've added your project, Drone Camp 2020 here. Um, the first thing you want to do, I, I, my, yours won't have a task in here because you just created it, but um, so yours will say zero tasks or it won't say anything right there. First thing you do is this select images and GCP button. We don't have our GCP, so we're just going to go chase down those images. And then open up the um, zip file that you downloaded. It has our 18 sample Brighton Beach photos in it. Select all of those and then click open. And 
usable processing nodes. Um, that's probably going to be a network issue. Let's see. So there's a comment in the chat. If you see you don't have any usable processing nodes, let's see here. I'm going to pull this over. So here's my lightning. I'll the sidebar on this in case anybody's seen it. Um, so if you go to start a task and it says you don't have any usable processing nodes, go over here, open this up, and you should have lightning. If you click it, it should pull up something like this. Um, this should be green. If it is, it should be good to go. If there's red here or if this says something other than uh, or if it looks wildly different than what I'm showing here, then there's probably a problem with your application connecting to Lightning. So you might close the app and restart it. Um, if you're hearing this, if you're watching the presentation, your network's probably good. Um, but I'm thinking it's an issue with not being able to connect to Lightning. So, all right. And then let's see. Several reports of lightning being offline. Let's see. Could I, could I get a quick um, just show of hands in the in the in your participant window there? And anybody who doesn't have access to lightning, can you just throw that little red X up there and say you no? Know? I'm curious how widespread this is. Yeah, I got a couple. Yeah, so out of 122 people here, looks like three are reporting. They don't have access to like that. Yeah, I'm thinking this is going to be peculiar to those um, local installations or networks, unfortunately. Yeah. I would like, in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead. Um, but I apologize for that. All right. So let's say, all right, picked our images, give it a name, and you can call it whatever you want. Sample data set's fine. It's pretty boring, so recommend your dog's name, children's names. Something useful. Um, I usually name these. Um, I usually try and give myself some reminder because this is what shows up in the dashboard. I try and give myself some reminder of the configuration that I picked. Um, but for us, the sample data set is fine. So just give it a name. In the options drop down, pick DSM, DTM. And this is, as I, I mentioned earlier, de a default is usually a great place to start if you're not sure what to pick. Unless you're looking for something spe specific, just pick default. Um, in this case, and for us today, I want that digital terrain map because we're going to talk about that. So we're picking DSM DTM. It's an, a little slightly um, longer processing just by like a minute, um, but it generates another output for us. And then for resize images, the default here is yes. I almost always say yes, um, but for us today, because we're working on a really tiny data set, we're going to say no. Um, I, I decided when I was setting this up that that would give us slightly higher resolution in the model. Um, and not really cost as much in terms of processing time. So we're going to say no here. Normally, if you're using it, I recommend you start with yes, especially if you're if you've never run a um, you know a set of photos before. Um, but for us today, we're going to say no. And then to start the processing, after you gave it a name, picked your options, resize image no, um, you can click review, and then start processing. All right. So once that started, you should see uh, something along the lines of uploading images to processing node. Um, if you were resizing photos, it would show you that here first. Um, but it's just going to upload your 18 photos up to Lightning and then start that processing job. If you want to see what's going on, um, you can click this little task output to on. That will give you a box um, with that output. I show that. Yeah. 
Um, so it'll, this green bar won't start until everything is uploaded. And I think the task output doesn't start until things are uploaded as well. But once, once all the photos are up and it starts, it'll take a couple minutes and start the job and then it'll start running it. Then, you'll, then you should see some output here. So I'll let you get to that state. Um, and then I'm going to, and then I'm going to talk about outputs. Let me pause here a second. Let's see, how's our time? 155. Okay. Um, I'll pause here briefly and see if there's anything I can help with. Um, Cause we're going to go back to me talking in a second. Uh, yeah, question about the configuration. Um, let's see. Yeah, there's some questions that I can come back to. Um, quick question about the configuration. Can you back it up? You, um, let's see, it stores it. So when you download everything, you can get that configuration back. Um, you can also save, let's see here. Yeah. Yeah, you can you can edit and uh, duplicate and change these and, and save your own uh, configurations here. I'm not I'm a little fuzzy on how lightning handles that. I know locally you can save your own configurations here. I'm not sure they get stored at lightning if you're using the lightning client. Something to look at. All right. So hopefully everybody's got their jobs running. Um, and that's the end of our getting things started in the process. I'm going to talk about outputs a little bit. And I have a couple things to talk about and then we'll take a break and then do some questions and then we'll come back and, and work with our work with the outputs in your lightning client. So to the um, ortho mosaic images, if you if you're from your closed task and you don't have don't follow along with me here, um, this is just I'm just going to go through the outputs in some detail and show you what's there. Uh, we'll come back to your stuff in a moment. So 2D ortho mosaic, uh, you can get to it through view map, or if you're already looking at the model, you can you can click over. I'll show you that in a second. But that's the, that's this 2D ortho photo here. So if you eventually, when we pull this up on your system, this is more or less what you'll see. This is the this is the Brighton Beach test data set. And so the ortho is this piece in here. Um, you can see that the color's a little different. There's a line around it. It doesn't align that well with the roads. Um, so the alignment issue that we're looking at here is because we have a tiny data set and it's not, you know, there's no ground control. Um, there are only 18 photos. And so this is, ODM is doing its best here, but you, my preference was to do something that we could run through entirely. Um, so it's a small data set and it's going to be more imprecise and have some holes as a result. But, so this is your ortho photo. This is that flattened version of the 3D model. Um, and if you, zoom into it, which we'll do a little bit later, you can see that it's pretty high. Uh, there's a, a great deal of detail here. So it looks a lot like um, a high resolution photo when you zoom into it. It's overlaid. Um, so you can see it in context on a Google map. You can change that base map to open street map. Uh, I think you can set up your own If you had your own map server, you could do that custom as well. Um, and there are a couple things you can do on here. You can uh, measure. So you could measure lines, you could measure areas, you can basically draw on the map and um, and get calculations in, in feet and meters uh, just by clicking around on the map, which is pretty helpful. And you can also generate contour lines based on the, the surface model, which we'll come back to as well. But um, this, these are the sorts of things that are interesting to do within, within the ortho photo. Um, the next tab, you can see that these tabs across the top, you'll have these in, in your client as well. Ortho photos on the left. The next one over is plant health. Um, and this, again, is you're using potentially a multispectral camera, such as a Micasense or a, a Centera or something like that. It, it uses, it records images with da data about wavelengths beyond visible spectrum. And then there are built in algorithms um, within open drone map. I don't work with this a lot, so I kind of stumble around the explanation. If this, this is an area where if you have questions, I'll, I'll do my best to try and answer them, but there's a lot, there are a lot of better resources online um, 
for this for this as well. So in here you can plant health gets generated even if you have regular photos. That's that's one question. Um, so you'll see this even if you just upload standard photos. Um, and it's interesting to sort of poke around with. But you can you can pick your algorithms. You can set up different color ranges, and then you can also drag these these gray bars, your max and min uh, values around if you want to kind of change the color ramp here. So, so that's plant health. That's the second output or the second orthophoto piece. And then the surface model moving over to the right there. This is uh, really similar, but you can see that the color has been replaced. The color of the photos has been replaced with a color that represents that the altitude. And so you can see it's easy to see terrain here. This is um, it highlights the altitude within your uh, photos instead of what the you know, visual color is. You can export this as well as um, the plant health. You can also you can export these things to GeoTIFF. So there's a big high resolution photo that you can download of this. Um, and it's located again, it's, it's got the GIS um, location info in it within the TIFF. So you could load that into your other GIS software or CAD or whatever. And then the, the digital terrain model it's very similar. You can see they're they're not wildly different here. You have all the same sorts of tools here, but the the difference between digital terrain model and the digital surface model is the surface is showing you everything um, on the top layer, and the terrain model actually classifies some of the points and says, okay, I know these are shrubs, these are trees, this is a building, um, and it tries to identify just what's the ground surface. So, digital surface model is all of the surfaces, including trees and buildings, um, the digital terrain model is just the ground or, tree, you know, does its best to, to figure out what's ground and, and what's not. So the DSM without the trees is how I like to think of it. Um, and then you, you can generate contour lines. Usually if you're gonna gener generate contour lines, it, would, it should be from this one. Um, so here's another example. This isn't our test data set, but this is um, digital surface map on the left. And you can see the trees, buildings, a lot of, uh, and then uh, digital terrain map on the right where ODM has classified a number of these items, figured out what it thinks is the ground surface and what's not and taken out all the stuff that it thinks is not. So obviously, it's, you know, it's missed some things over here in the trees and this kind of thing works. Um, it's okay. It's, I would say the ground classifiers are okay, but they're in there. All right. And then the 3D model, let's have a look at the 3D model. This is where you would access that. You can also, if you're on the map, no, yeah. just jump to the dashboard. You can also switch in between it if you're looking at the, the ortho photo, there's a little button. Um, I'll try and show you that in a little bit. And then the 3D model is your, you start out, you're looking at a point cloud. So this is what our Brighton Beach test data set uh, will look like when we pull it up. It shows not only the ground surface, but it's, it has calculated individual points um, in latitude, longitude, and altitude. And so you, you can see as you, you can't see it that well in this picture, but as we pan, or, pan and scroll around um, in the lightning interface, you'll see that you can see height and you can see that this, this thing, which isn't really obvious right here, is actually a little ditch. We'll see that. Um, so it's, it's uh, your point cloud. And you can do a few different things with it. Here's another one. Um, it's just from the open drone app website. I think that's in Africa. Um, yeah, so yeah, things you can do from the point cloud, the textured model. So over here on the left, the, you get your model here on the right. And then on the left, you have a set of tools or um, sort of a toolbar. Textured model is near the top. You probably have cameras above it in your version because this is an old screenshot. Um, but the textured model, you can turn that on and then it gives you not just the individual points here, but it also gives you, it gives you the colored mesh that sits on top of that. And so you can see kind of between these two, this is just the point cloud. And then when you turn on the textured model, it's a pretty big file. So it has to download a lot of data, but you can see it, it kind of fills in some of the gaps and things where points have been filtered out because they're not that Correct, it's taken some guesses with the mesh. Um, so it just looks a little cleaner and a little fuller. It's wildly inaccurate around the edges. Um, 
just because there's not enough coverage or there's not enough data for that. But it, toward the middle, um, things tend to be pretty reasonably precise. And so that's, that's your textured model. It starts with a point cloud. You can turn on the textured model too, and you can turn them on and off. Here's another textured model. All right, and then 3D measurements. Um, as with the ortho photo, you can make linear measurements. You could say, what's the difference, distance from this rock to you know, this little culvert right here. You can also make area measurements, but because this is three-dimensional, you can pick, um, you, could, you can look at things like volume, you can look at things like angle, height, uh, height profile. You could draw a line from you know, one side of this ditch to the other and see what, what the real you know, vertical difference is here. Um, so you can do some pretty interesting things. You could, you could measure lines, um, you know, not just across the X and the Y, but also vertically. So good stuff there. Um, yeah. And then you can download, these are, this is the other output. Um, everything that you can look at through the interface, you can also download, you get your ortho photo, you can do that as geotiff or tiles. You can download your terrain model and your surface model. You can download a point cloud, just a straight point cloud with no color. You can download a textured model as an OBJ file. And there, there are several others too, but these are really the most common ones, probably your, your ortho photo and your point cloud and your textured model and your camera parameters as well. Output quality. This is uh, something that comes up a lot with Open Drone Map. I um, I hear this a lot from other drone folks that I know that that um, use Pix4D and you know, other commercial software. Um, there's a there's a common uh, misperception in my in my opinion that output quality of Open Drone Map is not um, comparable to a commercial software. And what is true is that Open Drone Map is a little newer, um, Open Drone Map is has um, is collectively assembled, and so there are some areas where Open Drone Map is a little weaker, just because it doesn't have you know large commercial company budget behind it to have figured certain things out. But um, the output quality overall is, in my opinion, comparable to commercial products. Um, commercial output quality can be better um, with default settings. If you're just taking a set of images and putting them in Pix4D or Metashape or putting them in ODM, you will sometimes see that you know, the building edges are wavy or you know, things, things aren't, you know, that the quality, the visual quality just doesn't seem to be there with ODM. Um, that's usually a matter of set, tuning, finding some settings that work well, either with, either with your particular data set or um, with, with your particular drone. You don't always have to fiddle with those. And, and I would say great progress has been made in, in uh, improving the defaults just within the last six months. So if you start up Open Drone Map and run it with defaults, you're going to get better quality than you did uh, you know, nine, 12 months ago, for sure. Um, but commercial software tends to be better with default settings and also uh, if you have poor flight coverage. So if you have a really well covered area and a lot of photos with good overlap, and multiple flight angles. So some of them are pointing straight down and some of them are off, you know, pointed 10 degrees forward or something like that. Um, if you have really good co a photo coverage, ODM does great. It's just a little, it's not as strong at kind of filling in the gaps when the flight coverage isn't great or um, if, it if there are some, you know, settings that could be tweaked. So um, ODM along these lines, o ODM, Yeah, sorry, <laughs> lost my train of thought entirely. Yeah, okay, yeah, I said all that. Right, um, so this is a very helpful tool. If you want to assess output quality, so this is a project uh, that was done, I think late last year or earlier this year, actually. And this is, a, this is called the UAV Arena, and this was a, a bunch of Open Drone Map folks that also have the other, haven't used the other tools. So um, Drone Deploy, Drone Mapper, Pix40, Metashape, um, a lot of pilots that I know use multiple tools. 
Um, and so a lot of the ODM folks also have access to, the, to other tools and, and use them depending on the job. So everybody got together, picked a few data sets um, and said, okay, let's just do an apples to apples comparison of these. Let's see what ODM does. Let's see what Metashape does with this exact same set of files. And so it really is a nice apples to apples comparison. It's online. You can go there to this URL today and look at it. And it has this slider here. So you could on the left say, you want to look at open drone map and you want to compare that to Pix4D. It's got this slider, so it'll pull up the outputs for this data set um, from both applications and it'll give you a slider and you can, you can just slide it back and forth and compare like, in real time what, um, you know, what the output quality is between those two applications. So this is a nice way to assess it for yourself if, if you're interested. Pitfalls, other challenges with working with ODM. Um, I alluded to earlier, there are a lot of ways to get started with the application. Um, there are a lot of, it can be used in a lot of different contexts. It's not that clear where to start if you're not sure, um, if you're coming to the application for the first time. You know, online documentation, this is often true with open source. I feel like some of the online documentation may not be quite as friendly to beginners, um, just in terms of how to get started. So we, we need some work on that as well. But so people run into, People run into challenges with knowing where to start. Um, often I see people uh, starting with a really large data set that they have run through another application, Pix40 or something like that, or never tried with anything. Um, and then just throwing 500 photos at it and saying, well, it didn't, you know, it didn't work or it stopped processing and I'm not sure why. Um, so I, li I generally recommend that people start with a small data set or if you have a big project that you want to run, that you pick, I don't know, the first 50 photos out of it or something like that. So enough that you have contiguous photos with good overlap, but you're not trying to run the whole job at once. And then start small and then work your way up to the, to the full project. That is generally my recommendation. Um, and then it's a lot easier to work out problems along the way if you have them. Sometimes you don't have them. Uh, system resources. With Docker in particular, I see some of the defaults um, are tricky because when you install Docker on, particularly on Windows, it only gives you uh, a small amount of the available RAM, a small number of the available CPU processes. Um, so you really want, if you're using Open Draw Map on Docker, you really want to boost those things up. You have to go find your machine settings and turn up the number of CPUs and turn up the amount of RAM that's available. If you do it with the defaults, um, and I don't think our getting started documentation is very good about explaining this, but if you do it with the default Docker defaults, sometimes you'll get hung up even on a, just a normal size data set if you don't have a lot of RAM on your computer um, and it just won't be able to process it. So two of the areas where we're working on improvements are processing feedback. Some of this is, yeah, you know, a lot of the easy ones are kind of done, but there are definitely still some areas where it's hard to tell on a long processing job whether something is stuck and hung um, and is never going to finish or if it's just taking a long time. So sometimes um, people say, well, this has been running for 18 hours. I have no idea if it's almost going to, you know, whether it's even still doing anything. Um, there are different ways to troubleshoot that, but that's, this, that's definitely something that comes up a lot. Or it just failed it gave me an exit zero code or something, you know, something that doesn't make any sense to me at all. Um, this is one of the areas, <clears throat> excuse me, where I think commercial software does a better job too. It's just the error outputs and telling you, helping you figure out what might be problematic before you run the job. And also if it runs into trouble along the way, communicating that. Um, and then output quality versus expectation. I, there are people sometimes come to open drum map from, having used commercial software that's that's really tuned into their workflow um, and then you just try something out of the box and it's not that great and they say well this is you know open drone that sucks I'm not <laughs> you know, I don't this, uh, the output quality is too bad I'm not gonna use it so I you sometimes do have to spend a little time with that I think we're improving that as well with some improvements in the default um, camera parameters and things like that these are these are the common problems this is where I see a lot of uh, discussion on the online help forums Future direction, let me check in on our time. Okay, all right. Future direction, um, talking with 
so some of the core contributors, these are things that people are working on. Um, there's not, a, I don't have specific timelines or priorities on any of this, but better reporting statistics, GPU support. So graphics intensive things like photogrammetry um, often make use of advanced chips on video cards, GPU to do the, he the heavy lifting. This speeds up processing for video and um, 3D stuff games, uh, speed, speed the processing for photogrammetry. Open drawing that doesn't currently make use of GPU. So if you have a really fancy gaming laptop, um, the, the visual rendering is gonna be great, but the processing time won't be improved because of that. This is something, um, it's a complicated problem to solve within ODM, but um, people are working on it. A lot, there's a lot of demand for it. So um, that's coming eventually. And then along with that processing speed improvements in a couple of other areas as well. We're planning to add thermal image support and then uh, as, as well, the ability to add supplemental images from, from ground and 360 cameras to kind of fill in holes in more uh, vertical, vertical environments. All right. Cool. All right. So just running through really quickly. Um, ODM is a set of tools. It's not just a single application with lightning. It is, but everything's kind of bundled um, inside a, a, a wrapper there. Um, it really is a set of tools, some of which you, you may want to use and some of which you may not, but um, it, it's a collection of applications and it's as a project, it has brought a number of tools together to make a fairly usable um, solution for uh, working with drone imagery and, and drone data. So it's open source. Open source gives you benefits in, in both cost and, and control over your environment. Um, it's useful in all, many, many areas, um, same areas where um, any photogrammetry software would be useful, site assessment, site monitoring, disaster response, construction, agriculture, mapping, you know, utility inspection, any of those. Um, the output, the major outputs are two-dimensional ortho photos and, and then uh, some terrain and surface stuff, as well as plant health and uh, 3D outputs. Mostly your point cloud and, and texture mesh are the big ones there. It's kind of complex to get started with, um, and it can be a little fiddly to use, but um, it's also quite enjoyable and has a great community behind it. Output quality is comparable uh, as compared to commercial software. If you get your settings right um, and you have good flight coverage. So, uh, if you're interested in learning more, uh, thermal, I just saw, just saw a question about thermal that I'll sidebar on. Uh, does not currently handle thermal imaging, but that's in the works. That's in the works. All right. So if you're interested in learning more beyond today, um, obviously you can, you have it, most of you have it downloaded. You can install it locally um, or you can install the Lightning client. There's an online, the main online documentation is here. These slides will be available. Um, after as well, so if you need the URLs off of any of this stuff. But online documentation is okay, um, could always be improved. We're working on that. Um, there is a book. This is a little more plain language. Um, it, Piero, you can see his name here. Um, he's one of the core contributors. This is, a, this is one of the areas where if you spend a little bit of money to, um, you know, it, this goes right back into the ODM ecosystem. Um, he provides a lot of great resources, and I know uh, a number of people who just rave about this book. So it's thirty dollars well spent. It's a it's an ebook, I think. Um, Doc's book, UAV Arena. This is a, again that area for comparing output quality, apples to apples, and uh, online forum. So if you have questions, if you're if you're having trouble getting started with the application, or if you tried to run a job and it broke and you're not sure why, or you know the output quality is you know, your models folded in half instead of looking like the, the ground that you surveyed them. Um, this is where everybody chats about that stuff and tries to help each other. So this is a very active community. Um, lots of people post questions. All of the core contributors for the project are here. Um, everybody that knows all of the inner details of uh, why things might be doing, behaving in a certain way, um, they all participate here. So it's a great. It's free. Uh, yep. 
So this is where we'll take a break. I think what I'll do, since we're 2, 20, 10, 11, 20, um, we're going until 11.50. I'm going to say, I'm going to take five myself. Everybody can just go take five. I'll have a little bio break here. I'll come back and answer questions for about five minutes. I'll just scroll through the chat and, and we can talk a little bit about questions. And then we'll do the part B section of the, of the hands-on exercises. It won't take too long. Um, and then I think, we'll, I think we'll hit our time. So I'll take five. Andy, if that's all right. And then uh, we'll just come back and do some Q&A for about five minutes. Okay, I am back. I'll run through the chat here and see if there are questions. There are questions. See the questions I can answer. Um, oh yeah, I'm, I'm seeing some questions around the expected time to process. I'm seeing people, yeah, reporting from seven, eight minutes up to about 15 minutes. It, in my experience, um, it generally takes this job 12 to 14 minutes, kind of depending on your computer and how busy the Lightning Network is and, and all that. So if you're still running after 20 minutes, there's probably an issue. Um, I would expect it to have stopped and reported some error by then. Um, it's a small enough data set that I wouldn't expect that to happen really. But if there is, you know, processing delay, I would say if you're seeing times of 20 minutes or more, there's probably an issue. Point cloud, uh, question about the point cloud. Is it the same as a dense cloud render on Azure Soft? Yeah, uh, both Metashape and Open Drone Map will do a, a sparse point cloud first just to kind of figure out camera alignment. Um, I think with Metashape, you might be able to export that spark, work with the sparse point cloud. It's, it's um, ODM's point cloud is, is the dense point cloud. So I don't think it gives you separate access to the sparse point cloud for ODM in the way that Metashape might. But yeah, it is, it is comparable. All right. So we'll, um, let's say, I'll go until 11. Uh, let's talk for another two minutes or so. And then I think, oh yeah, I see some LinkedIn invitations here. All right, yeah, yeah, feel free. Um, if you have questions, you wanna follow up. In fact, Andy, are you on? Can I ask you a question? Might be muted. Sorry, I was muted. Hey, no problem, no problem. Um, what is, what's the schedule after this? If I wanted to stay on um, after we go through the exercises and answer questions, would that, would that be suitable or is there something that people need to roll into? Yeah, that'd be fine. Um, 12 to two is lunch, lunch break. So if you wanna stay on and take some questions, that'd be fine. Okay, sounds good. Well, I'll, I'll go until, um, I can stay until 12, 15. Um, so if, if we can just keep this line open at the end, at the end we'll do that. I'll, I'll plan to wrap up the exercises a little, a little before 12 though, so say 11.55. Okay, all right, very good. Um, double time for the double amount of photos. Yeah, that, uh, one more comment about the processing time. It's not, it's not exactly linear with the number of photos. Um, it depends a little bit on, well, what are, the, what are the, really the criteria there? Um, it's not exactly two times the number of photos. Sometimes it's less um, with a large number of photos, then it, there's a, a bit of the processing has to compare more photos with each other. And so it kind of grows exponentially into large, in the larger data sets. Um, so it's not exactly two times the number of photos. That's probably a, a reasonable um, way to, to estimate it. But yeah, it's, there's some other variables in there as well. All right, okay, cool. Yeah, you bet. All right, let's jump in to a break. No, let's jump into, so this will be part B if you have that um, exercises worksheet uh, and you're looking at it on paper, this is we're in part B now. If you don't, that's fine because it's all the same content, it's here and I'll, I'll walk through it. So 
hopefully um, many of you have your jobs have finished processing and it's ready to go. You have lightning up. I'm going to pull up my lightning client too in case I need to jump over to that. So if we want to see something in real time, we can do that. Of course, I just closed it. Okay. All right. So um, just to recap, because there are so many different flavors of Open Drone Map and Web ODM and yada yada. Um, Web ODM is the free one. You process it locally. The differences are so this is not what we're using. We're using Lightning. But Web ODM, just standard old plain old Web ODM, is you install it for free. You install it on your laptop or your desktop or server somewhere. Um, and you're doing all the processing and all that, it's all free. Um, Web ODM Lightning is a commercial service. It's by one of the core contributors, and so that money you know, stays local, but um, it is a commercial service. And what you're really doing is you get to install that for free and it's very easy, but it's processing your stuff in the cloud. So it's using Web ODMs or yeah, the, the Lightning services, cl cloud servers to do your task processing, and then you pay some nominal fee for that. So. And that's, I, that's approximately per image. I'm not sure, the pricing is on the website. Um, it's, not, um, it's not that expensive. But I unfortunately don't have a good pricing breakdown of that. But we're using Lightning. So we're using Lightning because it's free to start and it's easy, um, easy to set up. So um, hopefully this is not you. Hopefully you're not still running. Um, if you are, um, Hopefully it'll just take another couple of minutes and then you can kind of catch up with us. I'll, I'll go through the exercises. Um, if it's finished, it should look like this. So you should have completed. Da, 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 and you should be able to download, view the map, view the 3D model. Don't do all these things. I'm just showing you kind of what. Um, and then a quick reminder that I chose a small data set so we could process quickly. You can see the whole you know, <clears throat> spectrum of events. Um, and so the quality is better with larger data sets, but it's enough. So first exercise we'll do is viewing the map and you can pull up your lightning, lightning client and follow along here. Just some basic navigation. If you've already been playing with this, this will be kind of basic for you, but um, just basically navigating the photo. If you, if you click with your left, um, let's do this as I'm talking. If you click with your left mouse button, then and drag around and move the map and your scroll wheel on your mouse can zoom you in and out so you can see kind of where this sits on Lake Superior, I believe that is. Um, and if you get lost, like if you've scrolled too far out or something like that, I, I just go back to the dashboard and jump in here again quick. Um, but so the scroll wheel zooms you in and out and you can, if you zoom in, you can see this is pretty good, pretty decent resolution. Um, it's not high quality photo, but again, these are, this is a 3D model that's been squished flat. So uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's pretty good. Um, this little square down here gives you full screen. Not sure what that's going to do to zoom, but, um, and then your navigation still works. You can sc scroll around. Um, and then these top buttons take you through the plant health surface model. Takes a little while for these things to load. Uh, but that's what the, these top buttons help you navigate around. All right. Want to measure something? It's this tool right here. <clears throat> Excuse me. This little ruler L square thing. You um, can click that guy. Actually, I'm going to move over here. This space. Uh, you can click that and then say create a new measurement. And then you can just start clicking points on the map. You can say, I want to know the distance from this rock to that rock. So if you click two points, it's, it'll assume that you want to do a line. And then when you're done, you over here and you click finish measurement. And then it'll pop up a little box with the calculation. 18 meters, 58 feet on that. You can close it. And the line will stay there. These annotations, these measurements don't get saved. So um, 
if you go and look at the mo 3D model and come back to this, you'll lose it, I believe. Yeah, let's try. So there's our 3D model. Yep, okay, yeah. So if you're doing measurements, make sure you capture what, um, what you wanna know right then. You can navigate around in here, you can switch to the surface model or the terrain model and you'll still, you'll still have these. But if you go, if you leave this 2D environment, you'll, you'll lose these measurements. So that's how you do that. And then you can, if you need to pop that box up again, you can. You, if you wanna delete it, just click delete there. So if you wanna measure area, you can click the ruler again, new measurement, and then just click a, make a little rectangle here on the map somewhere. Doesn't mean any kind of polygon will do. You can use a, um, as many points as you want. And you don't have to end on the first point. Some tools make you do that. Really, you just go over here, make your last point. It'll fill in this last line for you when you click finish. And you can see it's already starting to calculate the area and perimeter for me. So I'll finish that. It gives me the area within the box in meters and acres, which is not helpful at this scale, but um, it gives you the perimeter of distance around this guy as well at in feet and meters. And then because this is, um, because it understands the underlying 3D um, dimension here, if this were on a, if this is on a slope, then it will figure out the total volume of that slope um, and give you cubic feet as well, cubic meters and cubic feet. So you can view those calculations and then, excuse me, again, if you want to delete it, you can just click it, get your little pop up and then delete. You can export this to GeoJSON. Is a way, so if you want, if you did want to save this rather than just taking a screenshot, um, you can export that. Um, but for now, we'll delete. I'll pause there for a second. All right, and let's go to plant health. So you can click the button up here at the top. Second button. Now you'll see that our test data set was not a multispectral camera, but still we have this available. Um, it, you know, don't read too much into the meaning here, but it does, as you can see, change the, um, it has run an algorithm against the, the um, data of the photo here. Um, so you can see there are different, this grassy area is a different color than this grassy area. It's different than this. You can see the kind of mowing lines in here. Um, you can click, let's see here. If I go to plant health, if you click this layers icon, this little like pedophore sandwich situation, um, you can pick, you can change the algorithm. You can, these are all the built-in algorithms that are available. Um, you can change your color options. And then what's, what's, possibly the most fun part of this, is you can drag these min and max bars around and change your color ramp. So you can see this is the number of values present on the map. Um, and so if you wanna really just focus on what, what is contained within the map instead of the very far max and the very far min, um, this gets a little more meaningful. And then the surface models do the same thing. We'll look at that in a second. So you can drag these guys around and it'll, it'll re-render the map. And it will have slightly different color ramps here, you can see. And then if you want to export this, um, it's georeference, so you can just click that. So it's, and then it offers it to you to, to uh, save. Usually takes a minute to generate those, um, and more so with the surface model. All right. And we can switch over to surface model. Uh, 
yeah. In DVI, I, I see a couple questions about the, the plant health um, algorithm. And let me, I'll, I'll spend just a second here. There's not, um, this is an area where I know very little, unfortunately. Um, so I can try to point you to some better documentation online. Um, but I, unfortunately, in, D, in DVI and looking at the uh, individual pixel values is not, uh, it's not something I'm going to be of much help plus, unfortunately. So I'll jump over to surface model. This one takes a minute to load up. Um, and as if you change the values, it'll take a minute to re-render as well. So surface model. So on the vegetation longer. indices, plant health question. Yeah. Um, if you come to the QGIS workshop, and I think even the one tomorrow for ArcPro, they'll talk about vegetation indices more broadly speaking, including what some of the ones that are available through, through WebODM. My guess would be you have to know what kind of the, the order of the bands for those things to be compute correctly. So getting some more documentation is probably smart. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Let's go to exercise four, surface model. Okay, so we pulled that up. Um, wait a second for it to load. And you can see here that the color now doesn't change based on the visual color. The color is based on the, the altitude or the calculated altitude at the, all these different points. So, um, Opacity is not something that I showed you earlier, but this guy down here at the bottom, if you want to see, because we're a little offset from the, the base map, just because it's a small data set, and, um, it's not that well located. Um, you can see that the location shifts, but if you want to just change your overlay opacity, this is where you do that. So there's that. All right, so we'll click the layers icon to get to the settings for the surface model. And you can see it has, uh, these are your color ramps. So you could change this to pastel, make it look a little more Eastery. There's some nice options in here. Um, shading, if you want to fiddle with shading, you can export the GeoTIFF again. Um, and then you can also, again, kind of drag these min and max bars around play with the shading. After you set these, it recalculates. There's not, at, at this point, there's not anything obvious to show you that it's recalculating, but if it's not, if you're not seeing it, it's because it's still working. When you change these things, it has to do some significant number crunching to give you the new colors. All right. And then you can export that as well. All right, moving on to terrain model. If you, uh, if you run your job with the defaults, you don't get this. Um, but because we picked, where's that? Yeah, because we picked DT, DSM DTM, this gets included. You can also um, go in here um, and just flip it on if you wanted to use the defaults, but, but add DTM. Um, this is why we picked it, was to get this little DTM piece. Go back here. <clears throat> All right, terrain model. So this, this, you won't have this terrain model button unless you specifically tell ODM that you want to include it. So if you don't see that, that, that would be something to check. Okay. So you wait for it to load. Color again varies by altitude. This is going to be really similar to the service model, although the color um, kind of sweep on here is going to be very different. Um, the, and that's generally because the min and the max values here are pretty different. So if you, if you fiddle with the min and the max and you get them set exactly the same as your surface model, you should see a, a, the same uh, ramp or you should, you know, these, this part where it goes from red to orange to yellow should also be red to orange to yellow on the surface model. You'll see some variance between the two in the, in the colors, um, unless you set this min and the max. But, but you can see again, you have these different color ramps that you can use for terrain. Um, you know, just pick whichever one you like. And then you can, you get, again, can set the min and the max here and export to GeoTIFF. Pretty straightforward, pretty straightforward. Um, let's see, all right. 
And then, okay, so next we're gonna jump over to the 3D model. So I'll, I'll pause here for a second in case people are still working with the 2D. Uh, let me check question. Would, it, would you recommend leaving min and max values at the default settings? Um, honestly, I don't, I would set them, I mean, you know, this is gonna matter, you know, what your analysis is probably, should probably drive this. I, the, I don't think the min and the max are necessarily the best defaults. It's just, I think this is probably um, you know, within some reasonable margin, this is just where it tries to capture most of the values here. So some, for certain, let's go back here. Yeah, so you can see there's this, there's this big span here. I think probably it's not, which means that you're gonna have an awful lot of blue, very little green, almost no yellow. I mean, it, I. I would play with these. I guess the short answer is no. I would I would bring these back down so that you you have most of your all your values are in here, but but there's a little bit more of a distribution across the whole color spectrum here. Kind of it depends on your eye and just what you find interesting to look at. Um, but as far as a general practice, I think it's fine to move these. Probably sometimes they're going to be way out here for for no really good reason. Um, so I think it's fine to move those. All right. Let's go to 3D model. So from the dashboard, you can use this 3D model button here. If you're still in Lightning and you're in, on the map, you can use this down here at the bottom right. I jump over. That'll load your 3D model. So with this one, just starting with basic navigation, um, there's, I'm kind of squished in here. You probably have more if you make your window bigger, you'll get more space to play with the model. I'm going to squish it in here just so I can see my writing. Um, basic navigation, left click, moves the model around. If you click and hold, you, know, you rotate the model. And right click, if you wanted to say, move it over to the right, the left or the right. Um, if you click and hold your right mouse button, that's what gives you this. Click and hold your left mouse button, it kind of changes your, where you're viewing from. The scroll wheel, again, is in and out. It's possible, kind of depending on where you are looking at things, to get into a place where the scroll wheel isn't doing much. It feels like it's stuck. Um, and then I just go, if, if that's the case for me, I'll, I'll just jump over to one of these little cubes because it'll just reorient you to uh, looking from above or looking from the side or you know, kind of depending on where, if you get stuck, just go find one of these colored cubes and the, the blue top is a good one. Um, and it will kind of reset your view. There's not really a button in here to do that. Um, the top left button, this guy, closes these tools. So this whole little toolbox over on the left here, top left button does that, or it can open it up again. And then the map button, this is new. If you have a slightly older version of OD, Web ODM or uh, the Lightning client, you won't have these, or you won't have this map. Um, but the map just shows you generally what um, space you're looking at and also where your camera is or where your um, you know, point of view is. So we can close that up. And then if we, I'll just make this bigger. You can kind of play around with that. It's just for, for orientation, um, it's kind of cool. So if you want to see exactly where you're looking from, it shows you where you are on the map as well as your point of reference. So there's that. What else do we want to look at? Um, oh yeah, measure and navigation tools. Are we going to measure things? Yes, okay. All right, yeah, just to show you where the tools are. Yeah, so on the left, there's this tools. This guy is expanded by default. There's a lot of stuff in here uh, that you can play with. If you want to change the way the mouse and the rotation stuff works, then you can start to play with these. I find the default here is the least confusing, so I just don't even go. <laughs> I don't even work with these. Um, some of these I'm not, uh, cam camera animation. Some of these I haven't even used. Um, but these are all about moving around the, the map. If you want to say, 
um, measure, then these are all your measurement tools. We'll look at these in, an, in the next exercises. We'll get into some details here, but the, you can you can look at angles, and this is all you going in and clicking points on the map to use these. But you can look at angles, uh, distance between two lines, uh, height. If you wanted to pick, um, like if you're on a, an incline, you could just pick two points on that incline and it'll show you the, the 90 degree height. Um, some nice tools here. And these, these, are, these are generic tools for working with uh, just point cloud stuff. There's a height profile, what else, area. Um, volume is tricky. There are a couple of volume tools to use here. Um, I'll show it to you after we do the other measurements. It's a little fiddly to use. I don't, I don't find it that useful. Uh, it's definitely possible. Um, but on smaller features, it's just, I find it sort of hard to use. And then what else? Navigation measurement. Appearance. Oh, yeah. Appearance up here. This is collapsed by default. Uh, but you, when you first load the 3D model here, it'll, it gives you, it only shows a million points. So if your underlying cloud has 8 million or 15 million, something like that, you can, you can boost this to make the point cloud a little higher resolution. It slows everything down, so it has to then, you know, rearrange all of these points as you turn and pan and, and zoom. So, unless you need that precision, you're probably going to want to leave that down in a million. But if you want to see really like what the max um, resolution is in your in your dense point cloud, that's where you do it. Um, there's some things for lighting, and then. Scene. scene is down toward the bottom. Occasionally, there's something in here that, that you need to set. Um, it's pretty rare. I can't even remember an example of why, but it, once in a while, there's something that you think might be under appearance, but it's actually under scene. So usually, if you add a measurement or an annotation, and you need to go check out some details of that, then they're going to show up under scene. So that's all the stuff, and that's how you kind of navigate around your model. If you needed to jump back to 2D, you could do that. Um, let's go to the next exercise, 251. Okay. All right. I'll pick up the pace a little bit. So, um, adjust your model so you can see some portion that's of interest to you. I'll rotate this around for myself and kind of drag it over this way. All right. And now, if you wanted to measure, I'll go under tools. Third measurement tool is this angled line right here. So this is just your distance between two points. And let's say I wanted to go from this rock. So you click that and then it gives you, now your cursor has a little red ball on it. So you can click that and you can apply it. You can zoom in and pick, really pick, you know, the, the point that you want. Um, or you can just kind of generally do it. I want to go between these rocks and then you, you click again. And then you right click. This is different than the ortho photo. So to finish your, finish your measurement, you click, you left click, you left click, and then you right click on that last dot to be done. And then it shows you 8.81 meters here. It doesn't convert to feet, so that's something to know. Uh, when you're in the 3D, when you're in the 3D mode, um, you're not getting those automatic conversions to feet, which is particularly unhelpful in the United States. Um, it's fine internationally. And um, yeah, so we can view the measured distance there. Let's go to the next exercise eight. So that was linear measurement. And uh, this time we'll do an area. You can leave that on um, and then just go some other place on your model. And this time you'll pick The top right measurement tool, which is this polygon here, this red box with the little inset side, click that. And then you can start clicking the points on the map to make your area where you want to figure out your area measurement. And it builds the, the polygon as you go. So it could be a weird shape. It doesn't have to be a box. Um, and then when you're finished, you can right click in that last point. It's generous about being you know, you don't have to be super precise, but it should be pretty close to the last point. And then you can see it auto, auto calculates all of these um, segment line segments and the 
interior area here. So, and this is meters, not feet or square feet. Um, there's probably, hopefully, soon going to be a way to um, automatically calculate those things. But currently, this is all in meters. But that's how you do it. And then if you wanted to remove that, you can uh, just remove everything. Yeah, so use this red X with caution. It doesn't ask for confirmation or anything. If you're, if you're finished with your measurements and you want to remove them, you can um, just take them off with that. And then they're gone. And as with the measurements on the, on the 2D ortho photo, these disappear if you navigate away. So you cannot really easily save them. Um, I feel like I'm probably missing an option for being able to download them, but um, right now I just work with these as screenshots. And it's pretty kludgy. All right, so your white, again, are these are the, the distances between these line segments, the green is the area. All right. Number nine, textured model. All right. So if you have uh, toward the top, you should have textured model. What you're looking at is the uh, point cloud. So if you zoom in, these are all just individual points. With the textured model, you start to get the polygons that fill in between those points. So you can go to texture model, show model. It takes a little while to load. Once it's loaded, you can flip it on, on and off pretty easily. But um, now it's easier to see things like the, the dip in this little trench. Um, when you zoom in, you're looking at polygons instead of um, points, and you can flip it on and off pretty easily. That part's pretty quick. Once it loads the first time, it's pretty quick to flip on and off. So there's your textured model. Um, things to note about the textured model. In the, air, in the edges, sorry, this is probably impossible to view. In the edges, you can see that you know, there's a wild terrain shifting happening all, along the edges. This stuff around the edge of the model is just very imprecise. Um, this in the interior is pretty good you can be pretty confident about the accuracy in here. As you get out toward the edges, just because there are fewer photos, there's fewer data, you know, there's, there's less data, um, you're gonna wanna not trust that because this beach is not doing what we're seeing here. This beach is not doing that. The interior part is probably doing that, but out here, not so much. And there are, there are settings you can use, as you use um, ODM more, there are settings that you can include that will cause that will tell it to dump these, you know, high error points. And so what you'll get is a smaller model, it'll, it'll just be clipped and kind of focused on the part that's the most precise. So that's something you set up in the, in the processing. All right, texture model, new cameras. Um, I, this is not practically that useful, but I just like this. So cameras, uh, this is a very new addition. It's only within the last, I think, six weeks or so. Um, but if you open up cameras and you say show cameras, then you get these, you get this, um, this is where the drone was when it took the photo. And it also, even though everything's pointing down right now, you can see the orientation of the camera as well. So you can see where this was taken. You, if you click it, you'll get the photo itself and you can download that image or I'm not sure what camera shots does. Um, but you can see, all right, each of these individual images um, the camera position. There might be a time in here. I don't know. Anyway, I'm just speculating at this point, but I think this is pretty cool. It's nice to see where all the photos were taken from. So you can see this is a nice uh, uniform flight plan. Um, some of mine are all over the place, um, manual flights, um, but it's nice to see where those are and which, which photos came from there. All right. Download. Um, you don't really need to spend much time with this. Um, you can download the ortho photo, again, this is the, that flat 2D bit. It's nice to load into other tools. You'll, if you want to just download one thing, um, you can download the, the ortho photo. And gives you a file like that. You can also download everything. Um, this is, doesn't really take appreciably longer. Everything's already been calculated. It just has to zip it up. So um, I usually just download all assets. And that gives you several directories after you, they're always the same for every um, download. 
So after you poke around in these, you'll, you'll get a pretty good idea of what's there. But um, the ortho photo, if you were just downloading the ortho, ortho photo, it's in here. Uh, if you wanted the, the point cloud, no, sorry, the object model, the textured model, that's going to be here. And then the point cloud is square. Oh, it's in georeferencing. I didn't actually show it on the slide, but um, it's in there. But so download everything, poke around the folders, um, and then you'll see what's there. All right. That is the end of the exercises. I'll, um, I'll point out I, again that there, this work is based on, um, you know, open drone map generally, but also this, some of the material in this presentation was put together by Stephen Mather. Uh, Piero is one of the key contributors um, who has a lot of um, his hands in a lot of work with open drone map. Um, and he was helpful in putting together some of this information as well. A lot of the screenshots and images and things I, I pulled um, and I wanted to use the um, test data set that we're using. You are welcome to reach out to me is my Twitter um, email, my LinkedIn here. Definitely, I mean, I, I know a little bit, go to the Open Drone Map forum and get connected if you're starting to use ODM and you have questions. Um, I'm happy to answer them as well, but uh, you might get more information and sometimes even better information if you go to the forum. So um, you're welcome to reach out to me, but, but definitely connect on the forum as well. So I think um, with that, Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, with that, I will go ahead and stay. I'll plan to stay on this conference line if we could keep it open another 15 minutes or so and just try and answer questions. If people have questions, um, we can talk about anything.